Uh, welcome back, Idiot Squared viewers. Thank you all 15 for tuning in. We really appreciate it. This week, we have a very interesting episode. We are going to be discussing genius, intelligence, creativity, and all of these things. Uh, this episode was sparked by a tweet I saw from Brian Romelli uh, that I sent through to Polska. And it is about a study that George Land and Beth Jarman conducted back in 1968 which we cannot find, but we are going to try and explore and look into this topic. Oscar, you've got the tweet up. Yeah. Did you want to go and read it, guy? Uh, I can. Yeah. Like I'll uh, intro it. So um, the tweet from Brian Romelli on X is in 1968, George Land with Beth Jarman conducted a research study to test the creativity of 1600 children, ranging in ages from three to five years old. This was the same creativity test he devised for NASA to help select innovative engineers and scientists. The assessment worked so well, he decided to try it on children. He then retested the same children at 10 years of age, again at 15 years of age, um, in brackets, a longitudinal study. The test was designed to indicate how well someone could look at an issue and devise new, different, innovative ways to address it. To do that, the they asked the children at these various ages to come up with ways to use a paperclip. The results may surprise you. Creativity scores amongst five-year-olds, 98%. Creativity scores amongst 10-year-olds, 30%. Creativity amongst 15-year-olds, 12%. Given to 280,000 adults, average age of 31, the creativity score was 2%. Uh, the results are not as we would expect, are they? The proportion of people who, who scored at the genius level decreased with age. We might think that it should increase with our level of education, but clearly not. Why is this? Well, it seems we have employed a system that educates the genius right out of people. And how have we done this? The Industrial Revolution began in Great Britain in the mid-1700s and by 1760 in the US was gaining steam. Literally, steam power was the catalyst. This first industrial revolution exploded from about 1760 to 1840. It was followed by the age of science and mass production, and then the digital revolution. We are now at the beginning of the next phase of dramatic technological expansion and social change, the fourth industrial revolution. Coinciding with the first industrial revolution was an educational revolution, public education. The system was created in the late 1600s and in the 1700s was developed into the system we still use today. It was designed to meet the challenges of the first industrial revolution. But when that revolution gave way to the second and third and fourth, our educational system did not. It was devoted to the original system. Alongside the first industrial revolution, it has continued to insist on manufacturing the same student over and over, tweaking content for new technologies. So, today's education system produces students. Conformity, uh, conformity just as any good industrial manufacturing process would do with its product, but not student creativity, diversity or individual expression, which, which fits the needs of our day. As a result, ideas for paperclips decline and genius dries up. This is not the path to a world where AI is built into everything. It is vital to bring our children back to the path of 98% genius level as presented by Dr. Land. We can, all, uh, we can also bring back us adults back from the institutional learning of schools and universities. The reality is we simply have no choices. Or we, sorry. We simply have no choice as there is no path forward if human individuality and creativity is not asserted as our primary function. This and always has been, this is, sorry, this is and always has been the path of humanity. We just need to remember to remember. Well said by Brian. Yeah, it's a really, really interesting tweet. Uh, I could play the video, but it essentially says the exact same thing. Think it's worth it? Should we play it? Uh, yeah, it's only a couple, it's like a minute, so yeah. The study that was done in the 1960s, and it was really um, uh, commissioned by NASA because they wanted to know how to hire more geniuses. 
So they hired George Land and his team to go out and figure out like what makes a genius. So they started with a group of five-year-olds and they gave them a creativity test. So the way they defined genius was, how do you use your creative imagination to solve problems? And what they found was of this group of five-year-olds, 98% qualified as geniuses. Then they came back five years later when this group was 10 years old and it was down to 30%. Five years later at 15, it was down to 12%. And then I think they just kind of gave up in like, discussed, but George Land took it further and went out and surveyed adults and found that only 2% of adults. And the thing that's also very interesting is he attributed this to school, 100% to school, that you would take a population, 98% genius, and dumb them down to 2%. And one of his quotes that I love is he said, uncreative behavior and thinking is learned. Oh, uncreative behavior is and thinking is learned. Shit, guy. Yeah, it's a powerful, powerful um, little quote there to finish. Um, I think there's probably yeah. a good amount of truth in that, to be honest. I think so. But what I find interesting is that um, Rubes and I, before the uh, pause started, we were trying to find the article and we couldn't find it. So if anyone out there can find it and send it to us, that would be great because we would love to read it. Because one of the things we wanted to take a look at was how exactly were they scoring this creative behavior? Um, and because that, I think that's like one of the most important things when we're reading the, uh, results, right. It's to understand how, how exactly they were scoring it. So we can get an understanding of how the study was actually conducted, because it'd be very interesting to understand, like, like, what is it that makes someone, um, genius because 98% of five-year-olds in the study were considered genius. That, that seems kind of crazy, right? Definitely. But um, I think, well, they did mention a little bit in there, but again, because we don't have the study, we can't 100% know what their criteria was, but um, something to do with like using creativity to solve a problem. So, um, you know, uh, there with problems, there isn't just one way to solve some problems. There's many different ways you can solve that problem. Um, and I think that's kind of what they were mentioning is that like at, at the, at the young age, the children would come up with a variety of different ways to solve problems, not just the, the stock standard, you know, like the one you might've been taught, so to speak. Um, and that's why they sort of score a bit higher is because at the age of five, they were using that, that, that creativity a lot more. And I think it, it, it's, it's a pretty interesting when you think about it, because when you think of school, in a sense, um, schools are designed to sort of, uh, you know, take a child that has all of this sort of potential and then sort of like, uh, narrow them down into a specific way of doing things, um, that, that fits into the industry or fits into industry so that they can get a job and they, they can be hired and they can go and, um, fulfill their job. Um, so what, what they were getting at in that tweet is like, we have our educational system is an artifact from an old time. Um, it's from that industrial revolution when, when, um, you know, the common example used is, uh, Henry Ford wanted to get people to work in the factories essentially. And so, you know, um, he, well, they needed to take people from regional areas, bring them into the cities or to wherever the manufacturing was and, and then sort of, um, you know, transform them or train them or treat, uh, teach them to be able to come in. Uh, you know, wear a uniform, follow orders, uh, do a task repetitively, um, that kind of stuff. Like they needed to train people to be cogs in a machine, if that makes sense. Um, and, and, and we still have that, like a similar education system from, yeah, from back then, whereas like things have changed a lot since then. Um, and that, that works for that time, but it hasn't adapted with the times, if that makes sense. Like it has to a degree, but not, not as much as it otherwise could be. Well, well, I think it's adapted in the sense that it's adapted based on newer technologies, but like the structure hasn't changed, like the way information is delivered and like the, the way that classrooms are designed, right? Like the seating arrangement and the teacher speaking and uh, the way they, I think, carry out lessons and also curriculums and, and sort of that sense that hasn't changed too much, but the context, right? Like based on new technologies, I think that has been updated. So it's yeah. the structure that hasn't been, I believe. Yeah. And there's many different ways to learn things, um, like sitting down and, you know, reading from a textbook and then answering questions, like that's a way to learn. Um, 
but it isn't the only way. Um, you know, typically that, you know, people say, um, you have, uh, some kids have ADD or ADHD. Um, and then there's, you know, a good amount of, uh, research and evidence to show that it's not necessarily, um, a, a, an attention deficit disorder. What it is, is they actually learn via doing instead of the sitting down and the rote memorization. And so there's different styles of learning. There's different ways to learn. And I think that with school, it's a very narrow path. Like there's only certain ways that can work very well. And if that works for you, then you'll be one of these high achievers. You'll be one of these people that gets, you know, good scores, goes on to you know, college, et cetera, et cetera. But if you don't, it doesn't mean that you're dumb. It doesn't mean that you're stupid, right? It just means that you might've learned differently or you, you might learn by doing different things. Um, in Australia, we have like um, trades, you know, like obviously there's trades all around the world, but we have like apprenticeships. That's what we call them. So, um, you know, typically people who aren't as book focused or, um, they don't want to be as book smart, so to speak, they'll drop out of school earlier and start and go into one of these apprenticeships where they can start to learn a trade. And the whole idea of that in my opinion, like what, what it seems to be is that, um, the apprenticeships are for the people who learn via doing with more hands-on. Right, they get into the workforce early, and they start to learn in the workforce through doing the work that they're going to need to do. Right, like they learn through doing instead of um, that sitting down, that memorization, that reading the textbook. Yeah, I believe the uh, three ways of learning. There's probably more, but the three ways I'm aware of that was taught to us in school is auditory learning, visual learning, and hands-on learning. Right? Are there any more that you're aware of? I think in that categorization, what do you say? Auditory, visual, and hands-on. Yeah, I think those are yeah. the three ways of learning that was taught to us um, in, in, in school. But obviously less hands-on, right? Mostly yeah. mostly visual and auditory. Yeah, and another thing that I think is very interesting is most things are taught very one-dimensionally. Um, so when you think about um, mathematics, it's taught as math, right? Whereas you, we use math in all sorts of different things. So um, it's not, you know, it's taught as mathematics, but you could also have in every other subject, you could be learning, you, you are learning about math to some degree, but you could incorporate that to see the practicality of math, like, like the, the appliedness of the math, so to speak. Even in art, right? Like in art, um, you, need, you learn about shapes, you learn about colors, you learn about composition, you learn about contrast, you learn about all of these different things. And they can all be explained with mathematics. Um, so you can use subjects to learn other subjects and, you know, it's typically sort of broken up into like, this is this clear subject, this is this clear subject. And it's not really taught how these different subjects interrelate to each other and how you can learn one from another thing and how learning, um, learning art gives you a different perspective on some mathematics and then vice versa. Right. So if the system is geared towards, um, teaching us to sort of serve the system, do you think that that's necessarily a bad thing and why? If, this, if the system is geared towards teaching us to play, to play a role in that system. Yeah, exactly. Because a school essentially gives us those tools to sort of serve the system, right? Be serving to, to, to the way the system functions and gets us ready for jobs that exist today and technologies that exist today. So the way school is structured is to sort of prepare us to sort of continue to, you know, to keep the machine running in a sense. So I, I get, I get that the issue with school is, is taking away the sort of creativity. It's diminishing creativity over the years, but and I understand why that could be bad, but also the system in which we live in does need to function, does need to run. Although I don't agree with how the system is ran, Again, it does need to function and run in, in order for things to progress. So it's not all bad, right? Yeah, no, I agree. I don't think it's all bad. Um, I, I think, yeah, like you said, um, the system sort of teaches people to fill roles within the system. Um, and I don't think that's an inherently bad thing. I think it's, it's, it's necessary, right, to maintain it, as you mentioned. Um, but it doesn't mean yeah. that what it's doing is the best that it could be. Um, and it doesn't mean that, that everybody needs to do that. Um, I think right. the, the thing I take from all of this is, is going, oh, okay. So, you know, schools have their place. 
but they may not be the best thing if you're trying or you're wanting to, um, you know, have children that are creative and can think laterally, not just linearly or like, you know, um, you know, yeah, not just in a straight line, but can think, you know, out to the side, around, obliquely, all of these different things. Um, that's what we need. We need that as well. We need the diversity. And so it's not about one being all one way and all, all the other way. It's about having a balance between the two, right? So for, for me, what this does is it just goes, oh, okay. So I can, I've, I've, I've been to school. You've been to, we've had, you know, um, different, but similar experiences in some sense. You know, we've, we know people that have been to schools and have had, you know, good outcomes, bad outcomes, all of these different things. And to go that, you know, school might be, might be the best fit for a decent amount of people. Um, it wasn't the best fit for me. I tended to learn much more once I left, um, and had the freedom to explore and, you know, didn't get limited to the amount of questions I could ask and all of these different things. And so, you know, for me, maybe school wasn't the best thing. And, and, um, but I haven't let that, I haven't let that limit me long-term because I've been able, luckily been able to explore things outside of that, um, and take the time and energy to do that. I think that's one of the best things about the internet is like, um, you, you just, it gives you access to so much. If you're, if you're a curious person and you're wanting to learn, you can really go hard on the internet. Like it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And that, and, that, and obviously the internet is just a recent, um, development in human history. Um, that hasn't been around this whole time. And so, um, I think school probably played a bigger role, uh, earlier on in that regard, because it sort of was one of the main ways that people could become more educated. Keeping that in mind, Brian wrote at the end here. The reality is we simply have no choice as there's no path forward if human individuality and creativity is not asserted as our primary function. What do you take away from that? And what do you think that, that means? Um, I think, well, I think that what he's saying there is that we need to, fundamentally, we need to encourage and help to flourish human creativity, right? Because that, that's, that's where all of the amazing things have come from, right? Like this is, this is where all the technological improvements is where all the advancements have, have arisen from is from these breakthroughs. Um, so we do, we need to foster that. We need for it to grow. Um, but I also don't think that it's going to be like this, you know, um, all of a sudden shift, like go from, you know, not having a system that does that to then all of a sudden having a system that just completely focuses on that. Um, and the other crazy thing is that like, even though we've had the schooling that we've had and all of these different things, progress has still been made. Um, like, you know, progress still marches forward. So I don't think it's all bad, but I think that yes, we could, as a society, we could definitely focus more on that. I think, um, it, I, I would like to think that it would have positive impacts on our quality of life and, and the direction that humanity heads in. Um, I also think that this is something like this is something we've spoken about a lot between this, you know, top down versus bottom up, um, system control versus individuals, um, and understanding that the the system doesn't have your best interests at heart. Um, the system is optimizing for the collective, for the system, right? Um, and so us as individuals, we need to keep that in mind. Um, and so, you know, if you are aware of that, then you sort of know, okay, well, the system won't have my best interests at heart. I need to have my best interests at heart. Um, and I think that's that's another way for you know, people that can recognize that and realize that um, can focus on that and 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 seek out different mechanisms from what the system is either providing or recommending. I agree. I agree because we do need both, right? It can't be either extreme because we, as we know, any type of extreme doesn't work long term. So there, there definitely needs to be many people who are taking part in the current school system. Maybe modify it, you know, update it, but. Um, it does function to create the soldiers and, um, you know, the workers that we need to keep our current society functioning until we get to the point where more things are automated, I suppose, and, and AI is starting to play a larger role in, uh, you know, in, in, I guess, the workforce, you could say. Um, but however, there's going to be like a big tra transition period. And alongside that, there should also be schooling or, you know, there are different types of schooling based upon individual, right? Like if, if there's a, if there's a kid that's obviously more hands-on, um, and he's very active and he's perceived as, as hyper, has a lot of energy, the classroom is probably not the best fit for, for that type of child. And 
the creativity that that child is expressing should obviously be monitored, but it, it shouldn't be just like, like no holds barred, but it should be s- sort of, um, harnessed and, 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 um, and certain Channels. channels from that channel. Yeah. Yeah. That's the word. Yeah, ex- exactly. Exactly. Because I, I don't dis- I don't agree with, I don't, there's been, I saw, what was the movie I saw with Bill Burr? I haven't watched the movie in so long. And I saw that, uh, Bill Burr came out with the movie recently. I'm like, yo, I gotta watch this. Cause I something about Bill dads. Burr. Yeah. Yeah. And in that, in that movie, obviously it was showing like a very extreme side of, of like liberal people, which probably a lot of them do exist. I don't doubt that, but it was very like, it was obviously a comedy and, and it, and the parenting style of, the uh, the one mother in that movie, or many mothers in that movie, was to just let the child express them themselves with no limits. So if they're if they're angry, the mom would be like, "How are you feeling right now?" The child's like, "I'm feeling angry," and she would sort of encourage him to express himself, and he starts screaming, ah, and she's like, "Yeah, like get it out," you know what I mean? And she wasn't putting any limitations on how he was expressing his emotions, and the kid was fucking nuts. Yes, but I can definitely see how some far left liberal parenting strategies could be that. And that's, that's not a good thing. We need to set boundaries, but also like you said, channel these sort of behaviors into the right direction. That's adaptive to the, to the learning style of that child. Yeah. So I, I I think one easy way to just summarize what you just said is like, um, no constraints are bad. Too many constraints are bad. And it's about finding the balance point, right? The, that yeah. there's a, there is a balance between, you know, too many constraints or not enough constraints. And I think traditional schooling has been, uh, you know, there's been probably, um, it's a very specific route. It's like, if you can't fit in, then you're out as a spo- as, as opposed to the schooling system being a little bit more adaptive. And I think that one of the beautiful things about, um, the advancements in technology, especially with AI now and, and, um, just digital services in general is that the school system can adapt to be more like that. It can be more adaptive. It can account for the differences in the way people learn, in the way people, um, express themselves and develop their creativity. Um, we can have more, um, yeah, we can have a more adaptive dynamic education system as opposed to being so fixed and rigid. I think we've come from a very fixed, rigid, like it's like a big funnel. It takes a lot of people and then filters them down or like, you know, finds the people that are the best at following the orders and doing the thing. And then they're the ones, your eye guy didn't die. Uh, I like, I like lost my breath for a second. It's like, fuck. Well, I hope that doesn't happen again. Um, but yeah, that's like weird. that's the old school system is just like funnel, like getting a, uh, you know, bulk people, filtering them down until you find the people that are like really good at following those orders or, or, or going through those systems. And then everybody else is kind of just like, um, you know, they're just, yeah, cannon fodder, essentially. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, that doesn't matter because we got this, you know, we got this 2%, then that's enough. Like they'll, they'll be able to bring the rest of us forward as opposed to um, a system that actually takes all those people and then figures out like, okay, where are these people creative? Where are, they, where are their passions? Where are their interests? Where would their, um, you know, where do they have inherent um, skills or, or, um, predispositions to being good at something, so to speak. And then like harnessing that, how to channel it, how to, how to foster it, how to, you know, like support it and help to develop it as opposed to trying to like beat it out of someone. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, like you mentioned, like the kid that runs around and does all, like, you know, learns very differently. Traditional school doesn't have a way of dealing with that very well. Um, well, the ways that they deal with it don't work very well and that, that, that child doesn't get good outcomes, but it doesn't mean that that kid was an idiot or was always going to be that way. Um, it's, it's about having a education system that is adaptive, that can handle that volatility, that variance in people. And I think we're at the point now where we're getting, like, we're getting to the point where that is entirely possible, especially with AI. Agreed. Agreed. So since we couldn't find the actual study to sort of analyze it and get an understanding of how they were measuring creativity, I ended up asking Chad GPT to give me a little bit of insight of how that was being done. And so what it says is that during the object selection in the test, participants are typically given a common object, such as a paperclip, and are asked to come up with with as 
sorry, with as many different and creative uses for that object as they can think of. And now there's, and then there's a time limit. Participants are usually given a set amount of time, often around five to 10 minutes to brainstorm and list as many uses as they can. And the scoring portion, the results of the, of the scored based on the results are then scored based on the number of unique and original uses the individual generates for the object. Creativity in this context is measured by the ability to think beyond the obvious or conventional uses of the item. The more varied and unconventional the uses, the higher the creativity score. So okay. the scoring is sort of arbitrary, correct? Because, you know, how can I say what's more creative or less creative than, than the other? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think what it, it, was it saying that, um, difference from the norm. So if you said like, you know, um, hold paper together, <laughs> they're going to be like, yeah, duh, duh, it's a paper clip. Um, and so then like how far away it is from that use case and then the yeah. amount of like how many different use cases can you come up with? So essentially what I get from that is like when you get kids that are young, they're like, they're, they're sufficiently broad. Like they, they're, they're not constrained by, you know, reality as much, so to speak. So they can think very laterally. They can think outside of the box. They can come up with all crazy things. And I think it's just obviously evident in children that this is the case when they're young. Like, um, you look at kids and they play with toys and dolls and they're like having the best time. They're coming up with all these different things that they're doing and they're flying around. It's like the best thing ever for that kid. And we look at it, we're just like, that's just like two dolls. Like, what? How can you have that much fun? <laughs> right. But they've got superpowers and they're shooting each other. You know, like their imaginations are very vivid. Um, yeah. yeah. And one thing I was just thinking about, like, well, over the last couple of months is to do with uh, machine learning, like large language models. And so you have like, with large language models, you do this big sort of, um, you know, pre-training, right? Where you, where you take a, a large amount of data and then you start running, um, you know, the um, transformer algorithm and all of that over, over it. Okay. And you start to develop, you know, um, essentially, yeah, like a weight matrix, right? And then if you try to use that as a, as a, as a chat bot or you try to talk to it and ask questions, it, it won't be very good, right? Like it'll start talking about random shit and doing all this other stuff. And so then you, you want to sort of fine tune it, right? Or you want to narrow it. So it's very broad when you finish that training and then to, to get it to be, um, you know, usable, so to speak, you want to, you want to show it how you kind of want it to behave, if that makes sense. And so you're fine tuning it, you're narrowing it down to a specific use case and you get, uh, get gets a lot more coherent in that sense and i think like um there are very analogous things with children and like growing and then schooling like schooling is a form of fine tuning like you're essentially taking these kids that have all this different potential and then you're just narrowing them down into certain fields and if they don't fit in one of those buckets then they're out of the system or they're a you know, bad kid or they're dumb or whatever if that kind of makes sense does that kind of make sense as an analogy yeah, yeah, it does. It does. I was just thinking like how creativity could actually be scored though. Because if one kid says, oh, I can use this paperclip as a toothpick, or I can use it to pick a lock, right? Yep. Or I can use it, um, I don't know, some, something made more creative. Like if I put it on on water and it can act as a boat for bacteria or something strange and out of, out of the box and a five-year-old wouldn't normally say, how do you score something that a five-year-old normally wouldn't say as opposed to them just saying I could use as a tooth, right? So how do we, how do we give points? How are points allocated to what is considered more unique? That's what I would like to understand how the, the, um, scientists in the study were, were fudge in that, because that, I think that's mad important to understand when considering that 98% of five-year-olds are fucking geniuses, right? Yeah. Well, uh, the answer is, I don't know. And because we can't, yeah. find, like we, we can't read the original study and I, no one else seems yeah. to link to it by the way, which is random as well. So whether or not this, how true this is, I don't know. But, um, what I would, what I would, my, my general assumption would be, and obviously making assumptions is dangerous, but it, it seems to me like they would obviously, you know, quiz people and then they'd build up a, a, d a database of, you know, the answers that children give. And so there'll be like a distribution, you know, like a certain amount of kids will say this kind of stuff. And then, then you'll have out of distribution answers, like where a kid says something that hasn't been said before, so then that might give a really high creativity score. Um, but like there would be common answers, you know what I mean? Like obviously like, you know, holding paper together, 
using it to pick a lock, I think might be, you know, decently common, et cetera. And then you have, might, might have things that are, um, are less common, like, you know, using the paperclip on, uh, on water as a magnet or something like that, you know, or like, sorry, as a compass to, to see the, you know, North pole or South pole or whatever. Um, there could be lots of different ones. And I think the more out of distribution or the more varied they are from the original, then maybe the higher the creativity score. But it might just be sheer number, like how many different use cases can this kid come up with for this paperclip that are, I don't even know if they're valid or not. Like, did they, did, was there a thing in there? Like, this is one thing I'd like to know is, wait, yeah, a kid could say, um, you know, I'll, I'll use the paperclip as a spaceship. You know, is that considered creative, creative or is that considered like completely ridiculous? Because. Yeah, great point. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because if it doesn't actually function for that use then it, you know what i mean yeah yeah absolutely but it, but if the kid was able to explain oh like this paper clip can be used in, in like i don't know inside the spaceship to drive this one mechanism and like can can sort of like have like a legit idea then yeah that's a fucking genius to me yeah so i think that the way they were measuring like from what i read about this obviously not reading the study it just seems that it's about really is about creative thinking. Like how, how out of the box can you think essentially? And I think that it's obvious that children that are younger are able to think more creative because they're not as constrained, right? They really aren't as constrained. Like their, their, their neural nets, um, haven't been, haven't been fine tuned, right? Like they've, they've got so much variance. They've got so much out of the box sort of thinking because they haven't been narrowed in yet. Right. I think that is one way you can think of it. I think the attribution to school is likely fair, but it's probably not all of it. Society is like that as well. Plus, same as growing up, right? Like you can't pursue everything. You can only, you know, there, there is a finite amount of things that you can be interested in and that you can pursue. So you will have to get narrow at some point into something in a sense. So I, I asked Chat GPT if it was able to give me any specific types of answers that five year olds were giving during the study, and it actually gave me ten. Uh, yeah, but are they actually the real, or did it just hallucinate ten? <laughs> so I, I think it just hallucinated ten. But it says the George Lance uh, creativity test has been administered to people of various age groups, including five year old children. The responses from five year olds can be especially interesting and creative. Is young children often have vivid imaginations and are less constrained by conventional thinking, like what you were saying. Here are some example responses that a five-year-old might give when asked to generate alternative uses for a common object like a paperclip. So yeah, I just hallucinated a ton of them. But yeah, um, one of them is you can use it as a tiny pirate sword to fight off paper monsters. It's a hook for it's a hook for a make-believe fishing game in the bathtub. I can make a pretend crown for a king or queen. It's a robot arm or antenna. I can use it as a magic wand to cast spells. It's a necklace for a tiny toy doll. You can you can bend it and make it a, a circle to play ring toss. It's a tool for building really tiny houses for ants. I can use it to pick up tiny, hard to reach things like beads. It's a paper it's a paper clip superhero's cape. Okay. So the answers are kind of ridiculous. They're mad funny and mad cute, but they're they're like imagine a fifteen year old saying the exact same fucking answers. You'd be but like, they hey. also score ninety eight percent genius. Or is the test then is the test then like based on on age? Like because a fifteen year old saying that would just was just sound. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I tend to agree there. Um, so yeah, I look, I think that, I think that's what it really is, is it's like, um, you know, the kids are just like the younger kids are just so much less constrained in their thinking. And I think that's how they're, they're, they're obviously measuring the creativity and they're associating that with, with genius. So like the more creative or the less constrained you are in thinking, the more genius you are. Uh, yeah, yeah, there could definitely be some problems here with the, with the study. I, th I still think it's an interesting concept to think about um, as like, you know, we do start very broad. We do start with like, you know, a, quite a lot of potential and that ability to be very creative. Um, one thing I think that it, it does show to a degree, or even just thinking about this, you, you can sort of 
I don't know, maybe see for yourself, um, is that lots of school is teaching you how to do something a way, like one way, when there's actually lots of different ways that it could be done. And it doesn't, and just because you're taught that this is the way to do it doesn't mean that that is the only way or even like the most correct way or the most efficient or the best or the most useful or any number of those different, you know, ways to, to, to rank it. But like we're taught, you know, like, um, what's an example? Have you ever seen this, um, the, the kids that are taught to use like abacuses in their mind to what's do an abacus? addition, multiplication, bro, what? An abacus is um, an old school accounting device or counting device. So it's, um, imagine you have like, um, it's like a rectangle and you have a series of, um, of lot, like um, sticks with beads on them. And oh, then how you yeah, move yeah, yeah. the beads. Yeah. Yeah. I know what it is. An abacus. Yeah. I'm going to share my screen, guy. Uh, yeah. Pl uh, did you know that plural for abacus is abacai? <laughs> abacai. Okay. Yeah. No, I, this thing, right? Yes. That is an abacus. Well, yeah. That, those yeah. are abacai. Yeah. Right. Right. These are abacai <laughs> or abacuses. Um, so we're taught like, I don't know, in Australia, when I went to school, I was taught a certain way to do addition. I was just, you know, taught a certain, you know, you had to memorize your multiplication tables. You had to do all this different stuff. Right. And, um, it, it was relatively useful, I suppose, you know, but I don't think it was the best way. Like there's, there's, um, stories about other people, you know, like you've got the very famous Ramanujan who was able to do like just insane mathematical stuff in his head because of the way he thought about it. Right. Like he had a different model for thinking about these things that allowed him to do insane mathematical computation, um, and to see numbers and, and mathematics in a very different light because he, he was looking at it differently. Um, and we, we, you know, we're not taught that. But in India, the reason I brought up the abacus was um, there's children that and I've only seen this in India. It might be elsewhere in the world, um, but they're taught to like visualize an abacus in their head. So you can rat like there's this, there's a video, I, I can get it up in a second of this, this girl and this guy is like, you know, 26 plus 35 plus 42 plus 99 plus 100 plus 27 plus this plus that minus this minus this minus, you know, just like, you know, 40 numbers rapid succession and then she'll just be like equals whatever the number is in like a split second because in her mind she's actually using an abacus and so she does these hand signals and that's her cueing it in her mind so she's like they've been taught to count add subtract multiply um using the a mental abacus instead of a real abacus and i was like wow like so there's so many different ways to do this. There's different ways to, to cross multiply that. Yeah. Like there's all these different ways of doing math. There isn't just like one way to do it. Um, yeah. And I think that's also really interesting, but we sort of, we tend to narrow it on, on singular paths, as opposed to acknowledging that there are many different paths. That's, um, that's pretty cool have, actually. Yeah, it's insane. Um, if you give, you, you riff on that for a second, I'll, um, I'll get the video up. 75 plus 21 minus 96 plus 23 plus 21 minus 44 plus 11 plus 17 answer is 28 28 is correct 26 plus 22 minus 48 plus 29 minus 11 17 35 12 answer is 82 82 is correct answer 29 again 29 once again 29 minus 86 53 24 21 minus 8 answer is 91 excellent above three digits karo 123 plus 121 minus 244 158 plus 121 answer is 279 great 279 is correct ek aur karo 265 plus 134 minus 399 158 minus 147 answer is 011 011 11 is correct above multiplication karo theek hai 75 multiplied by 5 answer is 375 46 multiplied by 8 99 multiplied by 9 891 84 multiplied by 6 504 excellent 
तेज करोगे आप रेडी बहुत अच्छा 28 plus 22 plus again 22 once again plus 22 minus 34 minus 50 11 17 answer is 38 38 is correct bahut acha i do agree that our schooling system does sort of take away creativity it's i mean it's obvious it does and i've heard many people speak about this on multiple podcasts in in, in the past so I, i know that it's that is to be uh, that is to be true um and it's really interesting because in Brian's tweet or in or in this sorry in the study you can see that so 5 year olds have a again a 98% creativity score so 90% geniuses and then it goes down to 30% in 10 year olds right so it's not even like it cuts in half but like less like it cuts down like into less than a third so in 5 years um basically 68% of students lose their genius ability from the 98 if i can if i can say the percentages in that way and then from 10 to 15 it drops to, again by like into a third like 12% from 30% to 12% so it's crazy how rapid it is and by the time you're an adult apparently it's 2% that's the average which is crazy like it goes from 98% five years old to 2% 31 years old like that's 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 insane but it makes sense because we are taught to speak the language of our world we're taught to exist in our world and sort of just um regurgitate information that is given to us that's how exams work as well right like during um high school and especially especially university um university most of your grade is based on regurgitating information that you learned onto a multiple choice exam less and less exams actually have open ended um questions right where you're able to like explain an answer and you know have like a like a written formed answer like those are actually less and less and less and most exams even i think even like the mcat for example or to become a lawyer at the um Uh, there's another exam to become a lawyer it's it's mostly multiple choice like heavily heavily multiple choice and that's basically just memorizing shit from a book and then re- basically regurgitating it in a way on a multiple choice exam so you're taught all of this information in a short period of time and then you get hit with the exam and then it's on to like the next exam right so you almost forget a lot of what you just learned because you have to now attack all this new information for for the following exam So that's why the creativity becomes decreases so rapidly because in school that's all we learn. Okay, regurgitate this, regurgitate that. Even math works the same way. Like math, you have to do it over and over and over again and then you can replicate it on on a test. And the the test questions which you're given are very similar to the ones that were learned in 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 the program. There's very little transferable skills from one question to the next right you just have to replicate what you've done for hours and hours and hours and now do it on just on a slightly different question in in math and in science is mostly memorization to everything in school pretty much in university is just memorizing so that's why when you ask the same question to an adult as you do a 5 year old it's very difficult to become that creative because you're just going to regurgitate things that you know that the paper clip can be used for that you've seen other people use it for right because it's not something that you've studied but well that, that's interesting actually because you've kind of lost your ability yeah yeah because because your your now your your brain is now fixated on just regurgitating information so now when asked about uses for a paper clip you're just going to regurgitate things that you've seen other people do and not think about something on your own yeah so a couple of things there uh, one thing i just like as you interact with people in order to communicate with you have to be u- using like a shared language 
And as you communicate and interact with people, you are becoming entangled with them and the environment, right? And so if you think sufficiently differently to everybody around you, it's very hard to communicate because the way you perceive things, the way you see things, or the way that you conceptualize things will be sufficiently different to other people around you. So you either, they either need to get onto your page or you get onto their page. And it just so happens that the, the numbers, like, you know, like the amount of people that are on a similar page, like, you know, think about things in a similar way. It's, typical that the, you know, that the outsider will then become like the outsider who thinks sufficiently differently will end up conforming to how the rest of the group sees and thinks about things. And so it's like a bit of osm osmosis in that regard. Like it's hard to be sufficiently different. You know, um, you think about like way, way back when we did first episode, we're talking about the Wolfram physics project. Um, we're trying to go through all that stuff. It was sufficiently different for you, right? Like it was super difficult to, and like, it's hard to even wrap your head around the concepts because it's so different. So how can you, how can, if that was the language that I only, that, the, that was the only language I spoke, how hard would that be for you to, and me to interact and engage with each other? It'd be really tough. Um, and so I think that's, that's also part of it as well. Um, and the other thing with, with the school that you are mentioning with teachers and exams and things like that is a lot of the time you're limited by the test and by the teachers and by the people marking the test, right? Like you could come up with a, a very, an accurate answer from a completely different directional re set of reasoning that was correct, but because the teacher wasn't familiar with it or they didn't know that, they could still mark you as wrong. So there's so many forcing functions to get you to conform to the way that it's done in that system that it like, it the system needs to do it, but it also hurts the system as well, if that kind of makes sense. I heard something interesting recently about that, actually. Um, so it goes a little bit deeper than that now, because recently, you know, with this big left-wing push and liberal bullshit that's happening in universities, and and because of that, many new programs have sprouted, like, you know, like some of the social, um, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, um, but, you, you know, in like the, the realm of, Social studies, social justice, yeah, like social justice, yeah, like that that kind of area of of study. Basically, I this is what I've heard is that if you don't if you don't sort of write a paper that's geared towards something that the, the professor agrees with, they're going to mark it as wrong, you know, or as not as adequate. And so to sort of um, jump the system, what's the fucking see? Damn. You know what I mean? Hijack. Yeah. You have to sort of write in the language of the professor in agreement with the professor, sort of stroking that ego to get a good grade. And that's, that's crazy. That's even worsening an already worse situation of decreasing creativity. Now we have to think like these fucking liberal communist fucks. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. I do. No, I do. Um, I, 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 I do, but you see how this is, it's, they're forcing functions, right? Like it's, um, yeah, and, and it, and it's weird because it's a test in and of itself, right? Like if you're going to play that game, then they, they win essentially. Like if you're going to change the way you write about things, the language you use and the rest of it to get that good ma, right? You're, you're playing into their hand essentially. It isn't the best thing for society. It isn't the best thing for all of those other, like, yeah, but you like, that's, that, that's how they get it. And they're, they're essentially like, that's a filter. That's a, that's a filtering function as well, because, you know, a percentage of people won't do that, but other people will, they'll change the way that they write. They'll change their opinion on something just to please somebody or just to get good marks. And like, yeah, yeah it, it, it's self-fulfilling for that person and the rest, but it isn't, it isn't leading to long, like it isn't, it isn't, it isn't as robust as it could be. It's a huge issue, eh? So it's a it's huge done. fucking issue because university and school needs to be an area where you can explore ideas and discuss ideas, debate ideas. That's what the university was made for. That's why we have universities. So getting away from that and going to sort of the streamlined um, left-wing liberal thinking is very, very dangerous. And again, it's just going to drive this creativity um, pandemic further downhill 
Yeah. No, I, I would, I tend to agree with you on that. Um, it is, it is interesting because all those people that do do those things, they're waiting, like they're heavily waiting the mark. They're heavily waiting the approval of that person, right? Like, I, you know, I'm sure you've heard many of these stories, but where you, you, know, you just mentioned the gatekeepers, right? Like they won't even promote you unless you start to, to behave more like they want you to behave, et cetera. And so this is where these systems end up, you know, they, they literally transform people into, into what they need as opposed to what that person's potential could be. Um, I think that's actually, that's actually an interesting thing to think about is transforming people into what the system needs versus what would that person's full potential be or helping them to realize their full potential. And this is again, where like, we have to understand that the, the, these large scale systems um, optimize for the system, right? Not the individual. But like one great way to benefit the system is to have individuals that are reaching their potential or realizing their potential. Here's a crazy thought. If AI evolves to the point where everything is automated, do we even need creative people anymore? Uh, yeah, I don't know. That is a good point. Um, I don't know. What's it is, this is still like, you know, uh, a heated debate in the, in, um, the AI and philosophers circles is whether or not AI can actually be creative. Um, I use it pretty regularly and there are instances where it, it, it looks as if it is being creative. Um, I like to utilize it for its ability to, to make analogies and to describe things in different terms. Um, and I consider that to be creative. I know that it's just, you know, essentially statistics on data, um, and, and, and you know, correlations between things, but it, it, it does have a use. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't, there are some people who really hold deeply to the fact that, you know, humans are the only things that can be creative, but I don't know if that's true. So thinking about that, are five-year-olds then having original thoughts? Are these creative ideas just literally just make belief in the moment or have they visually, did they see a pirate ship that day and they think the paperclip can be used as a, as a pirate sword? For example, like maybe they like a pirate show or they have a pirate toy and that sort of guess I think about that. Or is it just an original thought? Um, that they're having because it seems like AI is not necessarily having original thoughts, but it's sort of being creative based on information that it's fed. And that's like the issue with like adults now regurgitating information the same way AI is essentially regurgitating, regurgitating information. So I'm wondering, well, maybe AI can have like an original thought, but do you think five-year-olds are having original thoughts? Um, I think it's entirely possible that they do for sure. Um, I, I, I actually, since while we've been talking, I've been thinking about, I actually might want to look at like, um, brain scans. I want to look at like the, the level of connection in a, in a child's brain versus like at, over time. So like what happens is, is it a, is it a dense connected network? Like it, does it start out being really connected and then over time it becomes less and less connected, like becomes more sparse, the connections in the brain. Um, does it have something to do with that or does it start out really sparse and then over time it gets, um, more densely connected. Um, that's what I would like to understand, right? Cause you know, seeing children, you know, like, um, playing with young children and like, you know, having fun, like sh shoot them up games or whatever, you know, like interacting with, with children in that, in that play setting, you realize how creative their imaginations are. You realize how, um, they can turn like, you know, like a couple of sticks can become this giant cubby house or, you know, like a huge tree house and they're having the best time ever. Um, but I think it is, it's their ab ability to, to yeah, think outside the box. And I would like to understand if that's something to do with the con connectivity in their brain, right? Like, is it more connected when they're younger and it gets less connected over time? Or is it less connected when they're younger and gets more connected over time? I can imagine, like I can imagine, and, and, and I do have some understanding of this, of how like different pathways or different connections will get reinforced over time. Right. So yeah. maybe, maybe there is, um, a lot of pruning that, that, that happens along the way. And so it, it starts to like, you start with a, a decently connected thing. And then as, as certain pathways fire, they get reinforced. And then the pathways that don't fire as much, they get pruned off. 
right? And I can under, I can see how that would lead to, you know, less creativity, but more specificity. And maybe yeah. at the young age, because they've got more of these connections that aren't hard coded yet. And the pruning hasn't happened as much. They can make connections between things that otherwise aren't actually normally there. And I think that's where original thoughts can come from as well. You know, like, uh, you know, it's, there's, it's made, the child's made a connection to something that other people haven't thought of. And you don't know if it's true or not until you try or test or whatever. But yeah, I think that's an interesting thing to think about. What do you think about? Like, have you got much on that young, I don't know, like kid brain studies? No, no. I, um, so when I was in uni, I did, I did investigate activity levels in, um, in children, but we, but like my part of that study was looking at, so the children would wear like this actigraph, um, monitor on their wrist and on their hip, and it would basically track their movements in the X axes. And then I would just take that data and I would have to analyze like how much activity they're doing during the day, but we never actually looked or measured like creativity. Maybe, maybe that was, cause we had a lot of people on that study, maybe the, um, the psychology department or the social, or I don't know what department, maybe they might have done something like that, but I've never, I've never, um, looked at anything, anything like that before, but what I want to say was if, if we're going to measure out of the box thinking as creativity in a five-year-old, then I guess we could also apply that to an AI model. So I'm, I'm wondering in these analogies that you've been reading, would you consider some of these analogies to be considered out of the box thinking? Um, probably, well, it's all relative, isn't it? Like, so. To your average person, yes, yeah. but to somebody who really knows those two subjects, then it would be no, because they're, you know, like they're the analogies you can make between the two. So, um, for, yeah, the average person who doesn't know about the fields then yeah, it would be completely out of the box thinking, but for somebody who has been exposed to both fields at a good level, then it wouldn't be out of the box. It's just drawing connections that can be drawn. So. Yeah, that's a good question, but that that's how I would answer that. Yeah, I, I guess if you if you're able to use things that you've learned and sort of grow an idea or develop something or use it in a way to explain like a, a good analogy to somebody else, like the AI model does when you when you prompt it to, I guess that is considered creativity, right? Because you're using things that you've already learned to sort of push your ability further. I would say. So that's, that's definitely like a measurement of creativity. How well are you able to be, there's a good word for it. Um, industri no, industrious. When you, when you use like nothing and you make something out of it, like MacGyvering something. Resourceful. You know, MacGyver that's the word. Yeah. Yeah. Resourceful. As Someone who would be ingenious. Okay. Resourceful, ingenious. Those are really good measurements. I think. Right. Yeah. Resourcefulness is resourcefulness is, is a very else. is a very good one. Um, absolutely. Um so yeah, no, yeah. Creativity is very interesting. Um I don't think that that like you know, based off obviously we haven't read the study, but I don't think I, I think what they've presented is 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 thought provoking. We can't comment on how true or effective it is, but I can understand why that creativity would drop off, whether or not the gene level of genius, so to speak, drops off, right? Yeah, you know, whether or not there is that um, correlation between creativity and genius, we don't know because we can't read it. But it is interesting. I, I just found some stuff on the a young brain. So, um, yeah, huge pruning happens at a young age. Huge amounts of connections are made at a young age, also. So. Um, there's this a nice little graphic. I'll just quickly um, share this screen. What do you mean by pruning, by the way? Uh, so pruning connections. So making new connections and then pruning those connections in the brain. So think about your neural network. Um, so you're, you know, like making new connections all the time, trying to figure stuff out. But then if they don't get used again, right, or they're not used regularly, then your, your body will sort of like dissolve them or get rid of those connections if that makes sense. So that's pruning, pruning like a tree. Imagine 
like a tree grows out and then you prune parts of it because you want it to grow this way or you don't, you want it to have this nice shape or you want it to do this sort of thing. Oh, okay. Got, yeah, I got so you. So that pruning gotcha. happens in your brain. Uh, okay. So here we go. Loading. Okay. Yeah. I can see it now. Brain architecture. Um, which provides a foundation for future learning, behavior, and health, just as weak foundation compromises the quality and strength of a house. Adverse experience early in life can impair brain architecture with negative effects lasting into adulthood. Um, so it would be interesting to see with ch the children if you foster that sort of creative thinking and that out of the box, whether or not it persists over time, right? Like that's, that's what I would be interested in seeing. Um, okay, so brains are built over time from the bottom up. The basic architecture of the brain is constructed through an ongoing process that begins um, before birth and continues into adulthood. Uh, simpler neural connections and skills form first, followed by more complex circuits and skills. In the first few years of life, more than 1 million neural connections form every second. After this period of rapid proliferation, connections are reduced through a process called pruning. So what ends up happening, so we're sort of right in that, is that you start out very densely connected in a sense, all right? Um, and after this period of rapid proliferation, so you get all this interconnection, like you get all these connections done, then the then this pruning process starts and it starts to get rid of the things that aren't as useful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe I'm thinking about this as like that initial phase is like that, um, the sort of, you know, the pre-training and then everything after that is, is then fine tuning. Mm. That's wild, bro. So, because we know that the, the brain is plastic, so it does make and also lose neural connections based on, on use case. Like if you, if you stimulate certain parts of your brain, you can actually create more connections in that part of the brain. So it's crazy how, how this occurs. And this is something that leads to this lesser creative. So that's, that's nuts. Well, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Maybe that is the case. So, um, there's a nice little graphic just here, which shows you the age along the, um, the X axis and along the Y axis, um, it's obviously a different scale, but this is starting off with this blue line. It says the brain's ability to change in response to experience. So from like two, it's like super good at that. And then as the years go on, it drops off. Wow. So that's that plasticity. And then it's the There's amount of effort. Drop off. Yeah. The amount of effort, uh, the amount of effort such change requires. So at a young age, it's very easy to learn new stuff. And then as you get older and older and older, it gets harder and harder and harder. Um, obviously because the, the structures are in place already and it's hard to change those. Like if your, if your brain has gone in a certain direction, but you've got to go in a completely different direction, it's going to take a lot of effort to, to try and regrow that brain in that direction. Think about it like a tree. If you grow, grow a tree and it ends up with a kink because it had to go around something, um, and it kinks off to one side, um, it's going to require a lot of effort to try and straighten that, that tree back up. Guy, th this graph, it's, it's kind of small. It's hard to see, but is it starting at zero or at two on the X two. axis? Starting at two. It starts at two? Yeah. Look at the drop off between two and four, dude. That's crazy. It's yeah. so rapid. Definitely. Yeah. And then, and then between like 40, between 40 and 70, like it doesn't change that much. Like it, it goes down, obviously, but. And That's all crazy. of these things, so this is, this is done on, um, obviously this is, uh, it's from Levitt in 2009. I don't know how many people they used in their study, but this would be, you know, this is like done over large population groups. So, um, this is, these are sort of like averages, right? Like none of this is set in stone. Um, and one really cool thing that I will mention here is, um, lactate. So training so that you, you, you push yourself to produce sufficient amounts of lactate, um, can crosses the blood brain barrier and causes, um, nerve growth in the brain or, or neuro, ne neuronal connections and growth in the brain. So one way to maintain plasticity and to make sure that it's easier for your, your, um, body to change or continue changing and, and being plastic over time is to exercise and push your, uh, lactate levels during exercise. It'd be interesting to see this graph um, on like a group of artists, like if you did it with singers or like artists, artists, like, like painters and just many different artists from many different fields to see what this graph would look like. And it'd be even more interesting to see, um, another graph with, uh, artists that are also avid 
um, uh, like mushroom consumers or acid consumers. Or it'd also be cool to see just like avid, um, yeah, like drug users, but like mushrooms and, and acid and shit. Like those, the ones that sort of <laughs> get you in this creative mindset that, well, like, that you perceive as being creative. Uh, do you think yeah. you are you are more creative? Like absolutely, if you're on mushrooms, uh, creative. Yeah. Do you think um, mushrooms heightens creativity? It definitely um, enhances or it changes my perception. That is for sure. Um, I think I feel more creative on it. Um, whether or not I would be, I'm not entirely sure. I think my self-assessment would like to be yes, <laughs> but I don't know how accurate that would be. Um, interesting. Like you mentioned that about like, you'd like to see this graph for those different people. I still think it would be very similar. I really do. I, I just purely yeah. because of the way they've labeled this, like the amount of effort such change requires. So like to change your brain, like it will require effort. I think yeah. some people just might be more willing to do the effort and therefore and they might be used to doing that effort. Therefore, they, their self-perception of the amount of effort is less, but the effort relative to, you know, what you have to do would be similar, I would think. But a pure, mm -hmm. you go, sorry. It'd be, yeah, I think, I think you're probably right. It'd be curious to see how like a streamlined artist, like someone who only paints, like only ever paints in comparison to someone who does multiple facets of art, like consistently throughout their life. Like how yeah, that would so be uh, seeing generalist versus specialist. Seeing this yeah. graph, if we, if we did it for generalist versus versus specialist, that would be interesting to see. Um, yeah. But I think this is really hinting at something that's really important. Is like, yo, early childhood is uh, hella important. Like, really, 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 really important. Like, you want to be totally. um, having very like diverse and like. I'm going to say good, even though I don't know what that means. Like good exposure as a child. Like it's yeah. so important. Like if, if the, the brain's ability to change in response to experience drops off so rapidly, you want the experiences at this young age to just be as amazing and vast as you can, I suppose. Like that, that, that would really set you up for, for future life, man. Like if that, if you can lay some like, foundational connect like some very like if you can lay the foundation for a very uh universal structure in your brain you have really set yourself up with a huge advantage or you'll set that child up with a huge advantage like you think about yeah, that's emotional point. trauma or something at this young age and what that might do god i was thinking about the same thing man yeah that's why um that's why like it's sad to say, but that's why children who have traumatic experiences at young ages are have very difficult lives in the future. Not all of them, but a lot of the times it's it's that way. Like most, I don't know what the percentage would be, but almost all um, mental issues or diseases are stemmed from trauma, I believe, at a young age. I think, Is that I, right? yeah, there's some, yeah, uh, there's there's evidence to show that that does play a huge role. Absolutely. Um, interesting. Okay. Have you ever heard of Robert Sapolsky? No. He's like my favorite bi behavioral biologist. Um, he has a series of lectures on YouTube from, from um, Stanford or Harvard. I can't remember. Um, behavioral like, biologist? Behavioral biologist. So he went and lived okay. with like um, uh, apes and um, gorillas and all sorts of cool shit. He's a gangster. Anyway, he just put out a new book essentially saying that... Um, we don't have free will, um, which the way he uses the term, I tend to agree with to a degree, but I still have some disagreements. Um, but he, he would sort of say for this sort of stuff, like you mentioned the trauma at a young age, like that, that, that person can't really be held accountable for their actions because of everything that led to that point. So. I find that very interesting because you, you haven't heard of him and you have, it's very hard. Like, yeah, we can't obviously pivot to that, but, um, with that, like, I think we could do a pod on that. Would you be interested? Do a bit of research on Sapolsky 
His stuff is fascinating. Absolutely. Absolutely. But basically his thing is that you can't put the onus on the person for the way they are based on their, on their history and their past. Yeah. Like, um, it, 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 it's essentially like everything's deterministic in a sense. Um, and so, you know, wow. that, yeah, like in the court of law, they try to find out like, what was the intention? Like, did the person, did this person know, um, if they did this, it would be a bad thing. Did they plan ahead of time? You know, like all of these sorts of things to try and figure out that person's intentionality and to understand like, you know, oh, okay. Given all of this, they still made the decision. Okay. They're a bad person. Guy, let's fudge that pod next week. Yeah, I'm down. Sapolsky, right. Robert Sapolsky. I'll send you some stuff. It's very good. Uh, but that yeah, was I'm interesting. Gonna... Hopefully we find this study in the meantime. I'd be very interested. But it is interesting to think about, right? Like that these children scored very high on this creativity and they refer to it as genius. Or they, they correlate it with genius. Um, I think I can understand a bit better why that might be the case, but I still would really like to understand that that study. So if anybody does have it, please um, link us to it. We have not been able to find it. Yeah, well, hundred percent, one hundred percent. Have you got any closing Hi, remarks? No, I was almost about to beg again, and then I and then um, no, no begging, saw nothing else. <laughs> uh, Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Uh, if you've made it this far, we appreciate you. We appreciate your time and your attention. Um, and we would love to hear your feedback. Um, do you have any interesting things to discuss regarding creativity, geniuses, um, this um, pre-training, fine-tuning analogy between large language models, um, these forcing, fun like the institutions being forcing functions, channeling people into being the, or filling the roles that the, that the system needs to be fulfilled, um, you know, Feeding the creativity out of out of children, or do you have any interesting um, anecdotes uh, about children being incredibly creative beyond their years or beyond their their um, abilities, so to speak? Uh, if you do, let us know. Otherwise, thank you very much for listening. Have a lovely rest of your day, or morning, or night. Peace. I love you, bro. Peace. Love you, guy. Bye.